I moved from Idaho to Alaska about two months ago and already I have experienced something I never thought I would ever experience. After taking a week to recover from a five-day trek across Canada on the Alaska Highway, I had decided I was going to get out and explore the wilderness of my new home state and try to catch a glimpse of the wildlife such as moose and bears. The house I am renting is on the outskirts of the nearest town, so I basically live in the middle of the forest and have access to miles of dense woods. I still don't know what I had been thinking when I decided to go into the woods without anything but my phone, which at the time didn't get service in Alaska and some earbuds. I began running at a medium pace into the woods, hopping over bushes and branches while jamming out to some shaky graves. I had probably gone through about five songs when my shoelace got hooked on a fallen tree and I was thrown to the ground face first. I immediately got back up, swore out of irritation and began to put my earbuds back in when I realized I had no idea where I was. At some point, I had lost my sense of direction and had only but a faint idea as to which direction I had came from. I started to run the way I thought I had come from when I began to panic and second guess myself when I realized I should have come out into my backyard ages ago. I didn't want to panic because I knew that it would make everything worse if I did and I started to try and pinpoint the right direction. Of course I eventually realized that I was hopelessly and utterly lost without the slightest indication of which way would bring me to some sort of civilization. After a few brief moments of cursing and groaning I decided to follow my gut and go the direction which I thought would possibly lead me home. I started running at full speed, hoping to break the tree line in a matter of minutes when something on the ground had caught my eye. It was a backpack. I stopped instantly and looked around for a person or a campsite, but there was nothing I could see from the spot I was at which was situated at the bottom of a small hill. The bag looked as if it may have been abandoned for a few days at least, but was slightly damp from the rain earlier that morning. I kneeled down and picked the bag up, resting it against my knees. It had a heavy weight to it when I moved it so I knew that there was something inside. Looking back now, I remember the dark feeling I had that I got in my chest right before I had unzipped the main part of the backpack. Inside, there were bags of what I immediately knew was an assortment of illegal drugs and items used to administer them. I quickly stood up and took a step back. I had such a powerful feeling of dread that I felt like I was in imminent danger. I just wanted to get out of there and find my way home, so I started to run again, up to the top of the hill. I was hit with a wave of excitement when I saw a house at the bottom that was buried in the trees. I'd begun to make a start for it when something in my head told me to stop. The thought entered my mind that what I had just discovered was awfully close to this house. I wanted so badly to be out of the woods and find some form of civilization, but something told me that it wasn't safe. I ran away from the house along the tree line hoping that I would possibly stumble upon another house. After about 10 to 15 minutes I stumbled into a neighborhood of sorts and asked a man working in his yard for directions. He was kind enough to drive me home and assure me that everyone gets lost in Alaska at some point. As soon as I got home I showered and chugged some water and then immediately called the police to report what I had seen. However, due to the fact that I had no idea where I was, I couldn't tell them where to find the drugs or where the house was, so my report was basically useless. I just would have felt guilty if I hadn't have at least said something. I've driven all over the area down different roads trying to find the house, but I never have. It's probably for the best though because I don't want to get caught up in something I shouldn't be. I'm glad I had listened to my gut and kept running from that house because people in possession of such a large amount of illicit substances, I can only assume would be extremely dangerous. When I was in my second year of university, I lived alone. It was a downstairs flat with my bedroom facing towards the street. I had some heavy green curtains, so didn't mind too much. My friends lived about a 15 minute walk away and I would go over every day till sometimes about 3 or 4 a.m. or sometimes sleep over. I had a long distance boyfriend at the time, so I would sometimes be up late on Skype with him. Sometimes one thing might lead to another, if you know what I mean. Halloween rolls around and I'm out with my friends. I decide to go back to mine and 
do a little Skype Supergirl for my boyfriend. We get into it. We're having a great time. Curtains closed, lights off, just to be safe. I've had a drunk person try to get in once, sometimes trying to force the door open. Another time I fell asleep early and left the curtains open. It had been super creepy. I woke up and looked up to see a man in my window, staring, stood so close his nose almost touched the glass. I'd freaked out and spent the night in the living room. So the lights were off, curtains shut. I noticed a kind of flickering in my peripheral and looked around. While meeting at the bottom, the curtains parted very slightly near the top. Through the gap, there appears to be a trail of steam rising. I cover myself and get up to investigate. I have to get up and stand on my mattress on my tiptoes to see through. I'm not that too intimidating as I stand about five foot three. The source of the steam was the man's mouth, hunched over and panting, exposed at the waist, violently stroking his member. He'd managed to angle himself to take advantage of a barely two inch gap where the curtain didn't quite meet the wall. I try to quickly rearrange the curtains, grab my laptop and rush to hide in the living room. A few days later, there is a pink envelope waiting for me when I walk through the door. As I pick it up, various small change falls out. Written on the lip of the envelope, in a jagged capital letters, I mean you no harm, XXX. A horrible cold feeling spread through my body, dread overlapped by shock. I'd never felt anything like it. That feeling when your stomach drops, only it stays dropped. I turn the card over to read the address side, there in the same handwriting, to the girl in the front room. Opening it, I see it's a quite traditional sort of grievance card, cream with a delicate watercolor of a bouquet on the front, thinking of you in gold curvature next to it. The inside was completely covered by a message in all capitals, some letters backwards and words misspelled. I gave the card to the police, so can't recite the whole passage verbatim, but the essence was, I'm an old man who has lived on the street for a long time. Wasn't sure if it meant my street or the streets in general, more on that later. You made me the happiest I'd ever been in my life on Halloween, and I'm sorry I scared you. You were very beautiful. I love to watch you whether you're working on your computer or touching myself. Please leave your curtains open just a little bit more for me. Each time you do this, I will post a couple of pounds through the letterbox. Signed, Ken, XXXXXX. I called my friends, then got the police to come round. Basically, they couldn't really do anything. They took the card as evidence, gave me a case number, and said that they would get the patrol car to drive past my house for the near future. I stayed at my friends for a week and had one of them stay over at mine after that. That wasn't quite the last of Ken. Sometimes there would be a knocking at my window, but I kept my curtains 100% closed. Three or four months of no incidents later, we got snow. I was leaving my house, now in the habit of checking my curtains every time I left or got back to the house. I see a set of footprints tracing the entire front window, back and forth, back and forth like someone had been pacing, searching for the tiniest gap to peer in. After I moved, my friend had a job where she could check the local electoral register. We did find that a K. Mordu lived on my previous street, but that was as far as our investigating went. Because it was a studenty area, I would walk past that house on my way home for the next two years. A while after I moved out, I saw that the windows had been completely covered in newspaper, stuck from the inside. It seemed like someone else was having trouble with Ken still coming around. About two years ago, I moved into a new apartment. The walls were very thin and because of the fire safety laws in my city, my bedroom had one window, which led into the living room and none with outside access. The window will be important later. It was three bedrooms, one for me, one for the master tenant, and one spare, which at the time was rented out by a pretty friendly guy. Well, friendly guy had issues with his work visa and had to move back to Canada last minute, leaving us about two weeks to find another roommate. Our quickest and easiest option was Craigslist. 
Due to my work schedule, I had no part in the selection process, but was content when the new roommate moved in a little later. He seemed a bit off, but friendly. He was very tall, large guy, but pretty quiet and not someone I wanted to go out of my way to hang out with, but was okay to be around and be cordial with. About two weeks into his move in, the master tenant left for Hawaii, leaving him and I alone in the home for the month-long duration of his stay. For the first few days, things are normal. All of a sudden, about four days into the trip, I'm woken up at about 8am to a frantic knocking at my door. Roommate, who we'll call Kyle, is staying there when I open up, looking frazzled. He looks me dead in the eyes and says, Do you want to tell me what went on last night? To which I was shocked and confused because I had come home from work at about 9pm and immediately showered and went to bed. I explain this to him and he tells me that he heard me screaming and arguing with someone in my room, that he saw me in the side alley out the window arguing with our landlord, whom I'd never even seen at that point, that he'd heard coming in and out of our house. I tell him no way, none of that ever happened. After staring at me for a little longer, he leaves and doesn't bring it up again. The next morning I wake up to the same thing. This time he says he saw me arguing with my boyfriend. I was single at the time. He had seen me talking with our other roommate who was in Hawaii and asking me for the badge number of the officer I'd spoken to since he had apparently seen me talking to a bunch of police as well. This time, I get angry and more or less tell him to cut this out because I'm not doing anything and don't know what he's talking about. He gets a weird look on his face and says, I think I had a seizure in my sleep. The next time it happens, call an ambulance. And leaves for a bit, only to start knocking again about an hour later and when I open up, Kyle repeats the exact same story verbatim. This happens once more before I tell him to leave me alone and leave for work. I go to work as normal and I am reluctant to return that night but am too tired to switch to an alternate location. Big mistake. About 1am, I wake up to slamming doors. Kyle is pacing back and forth between his bedroom, the living room, and out the front door. Walking in and out of each room, turning the lights on and off, mumbling angrily and slamming the doors. I can see his figure pacing back and forth through the frosted window in my room that leads to the living room. Since my room is dark, he can't see inside. Suddenly he screams, I can't live like this. Why are you doing this to me? I think he's on the phone and don't respond. A few moments later, he screams my name repeatedly and I realize he's directing it towards me. I knew I had to get the F out of there, so... I very quietly creeped out of bed and started getting dressed and packing a bag of clothes for work in the morning. I'm almost done when he screams, I hear you, and charges over towards my room, slapping the wall next to my door but not touching the door itself. I look towards my window and see his shadow lean all the way forward, pressing his ears against the glass. I was terrified and sat completely still, unmoving. He eventually screams my name again and moves away from the window and I hear him start pacing between rooms again. Now, my shoes are kept on a rack outside my door and not inside my room, so I know that when I leave I'm going to need a moment to put them on. I decide to wait until his pacing takes him out of the front door again, at which time I plan to grab my shoes, put them on, and run. As I'm formulating this plan, the pacing stops. He screams, Do you want to fight about this? Come out right now and we'll fight, I swear to God. I'm a very small girl, five feet tall, and this guy is easily three times my size, so I'm definitely not looking to fight, thanks. After a few minutes, he turns off all the lights, and I hear the door to his room open and close, followed by silence. I wait for a moment to be sure I can't hear any movement, and then decide to take my chance. I took a breath and pulled my door open quickly. I step out and grab my shoes before I look up a second later and see him standing shirtless with just a pair of boxers and socks on. In the dark of the hallway, his arms hung slightly outward in an awkward position. He says in a low, calm voice, Ma'am, we need to talk. This is a hard no for me, so I grab my shoes and run out the door with them in hand. I run about half a block barefoot before I stop to put them on. When I look back, 
He's standing in the porch light of our front door, watching me run, but not moving. Luckily, I have a friend who lived two blocks away, and I had their spare key, so I let myself in and crashed there for the night. And that's where I stayed for the next week or so while we work things out with the master tenant, and Kyle agreed to move out within the week. He says he doesn't remember anything that happened, and wasn't sure if it was real or not. But if I said that's what went down, then it must be real. The day Kyle left, he sends me a photo of the house keys sitting on the table and says, I'm out. Nothing else. I take a friend over there with me to scout it and ensure that he actually had left. When we get there, we discover that not only had he left a ton of food and furniture, but he had ripped all of the fire alarms out of the ceilings. He had unscrewed and removed the deadbolt to the front door and left them lined up neatly on the front table. We then realized that my front door can only lock by using a key from the outside, and it had been locked when we arrived, meaning Kyle still had a key. We called a locksmith immediately. Even after changing the locks, I was still terrified to stay there alone afterwards, and never went to sleep at night without barricading the doors with chairs and other furniture. To this day, I still fear for his safety. He was obviously psychologically unstable, but also wonder what could have happened if I hadn't been as lucky as I was. I'm going to preface this story by saying that I am currently a 19-year-old girl, and when the story occurred, I was 14. In the summer of 2016, my grandmother, two younger sisters, and I drove 19 hours to San Antonio in Texas. My great-aunt lives there, and my recently deceased great-uncle lived there too. We were all going to visit my grandmother's oldest brother, as he had never really spent much time with us before. We spent the entire trip going out and about this military retirement home which my great-uncle lived in. We went to a neat little thrift shop that was a part of the community, and I bought a really old letter opener which I pretended was a dagger to freak my friends out with. The trip went well. We were there for about a week. We said our goodbyes to our distant relatives, and my grandmother told my sisters and I that she wanted to visit the Holocaust Museum before we left Texas and started our long drive. The museum had, and still has, a picture of her father in it. He was one of the first American doctors to get to Dachau, which was a concentration camp, and the picture is taken in front of a rather large pile of innocent people whose lives were stolen at Dachau, while my great-grandfather stands behind them with a look of sorrow. My sisters and I readily agreed to go. We wanted our sweet little grandma to see a picture of her daddy. She was very excited to show us the photo. We eventually arrived at the Holocaust Museum and it was devastatingly beautiful. The overall mood of the museum was somber and the walls were lined with photos from concentration camps and various other things that were present during the Holocaust. As we started our tour through the museum, I realized I had to use the restroom. Curse my tiny 14-year-old bladder, but... I decided I would hold it in until we would finish with the tour. Little did I know, the tour would take about an hour. I suffered through most of the tour and distracted myself by listening to people who worked at the museum and listened to my grandma recall stories from her father. There were a few people scattered about the museum as we walked through it. The lights were somewhat dim, as most museum lights are. I noticed that it was really quiet. Most people were very empathetic, as was I, throughout the tour. Near the end of the tour, my grandma finally found the photo she wanted to show us. She pointed to it excitedly and told one of the workers, that's my daddy. She went on to tell the worker about her father and what he did in Dachau, and at this moment I realized I really, really had to use the restroom. My sisters were looking at me funny as I frantically searched for the bathroom. My middle sister, I'll call her Jay, pointed to a restroom not far from where we stood. I told my sisters that I would be right back and I practically ran to the restroom. I opened the door, expecting it to be vacant, but to my demise, it was packed with women who were babbling on about nothing important to a 14-year-old me and women who were actually using the restroom. Now, I don't know if it's something wrong with me psychologically, but I absolutely cannot use a restroom when other people are present. It's always been an issue and it still is. You can imagine how rough that can be in certain situations. I resigned to waiting for the mass of women to leave the restroom and, as luck would have it, the women all left in about five minutes. There were about six stalls in this restroom, the handicapped stall being on the far left. 
I rushed into the stall directly next to it and practically threw myself onto the toilet. Except, as I sat there, I began to have a really eerie feeling. I held my breath. The restroom was completely silent and I knew it should be because everyone had left, but something churned in my stomach. The silence was deafening. It felt thick. Someone could have cut a knife through it. Something wasn't right and I needed to get out of the stall. I didn't even use the toilet, I just scrambled from the stall and assessed the restroom. Everything seemed alright, I didn't see anyone, all of the stall doors were closed and yet I still felt scared. I went to wash my hands as I would always wash my hands even if I didn't actually need to, when something inside me told me to look at the handicapped stall. I don't know what persuaded me to look, but I did. Alarm bells were ringing in my head. I slowly leaned back to get a better look at the stall, and my heart dropped. I know people claim that their heart sinks or drops or they freeze with fear, and all of what they claim is true. My heart jumped to my throat, and I suddenly felt ill. What I saw was a leg on the floor. A child's leg. It was attached to someone, but I was too scared to investigate any further. I ran from the restroom to my younger sister's. I don't know why I did this, I was a dumb 14 year old, but I needed my sister to confirm what I'd seen. They were skeptical when I had told them what was in the restroom. I dragged my younger sister back into the restroom with me, begging them to be quiet, and I pointed to the handicap stall. My younger sister, Anne, looked at me in alarm, then Jay did the same. There was long hair next to the leg now, almost as if though they were crouching to look under the stall at us but at the same time they were completely still, unnaturally still. I grabbed both of my sister's hands and urgently pulled them from the restroom. We ran up to my grandmother and all three of us started rambling at once. The worker by my grandmother looked at us all in concern. I eventually explained the situation to the kind woman who worked there and she looked very unsettled. I watched as she grabbed a large, burly security guard. He looked from her to us and said that he would go take a look. We waited with my grandmother and the worker for the security guard to come back. He exited the woman's restroom fairly quickly and rushed to speak to the worker. A man was speaking on his phone in there. The security guard spoke lowly. My heart seemed to drop a little more. He? I saw a child's leg in there. There wasn't a man in there too, was there? I thought. The woman glanced at my sisters and I before listening to the security guard again. The security guard confirmed that there were two people in the handicapped stall, and by this point my grandmother was freaked out enough to say it was time for us to leave. The security guard had readily agreed. I'm sorry to say that we didn't stick around to find out what that man was doing in the woman's restroom and the handicapped stall with a child on the floor. I didn't get to find out why they were so silent that I couldn't hear them breathing in the stall next to me or why he was on the phone after I rushed out. I will say, though, that this experience left me with an even bigger fear of public restrooms, and since I have such a wild imagination, I did not sleep that night. Images of that leg and thoughts of someone trying to peek at me, either over or under the stall, haunted me all night. I was the one who snapped, and this is my story. I'm a pacifist. I give bees honey water when they are dying and I love all living beings. The thought of anything or anyone being in pain hurts me within my soul. I was 14. I grew up in a violent household and my 7 year old brother and 5 year old sister and 12 year old me were abandoned by our parents. I could take the easy way out and blame them but no, this was me. I remember the day in a haze. The day I snapped I wasn't feeling well. I often have days that I hurt all over and have pains in my chest and heart, so the day in question, I was feeling unwell. My siblings had been driving me crazy for days, it was a school break. I asked my brother if he would wash the few dishes in the kitchen. He agreed. After resting for a couple of hours, I made my way to the kitchen to cook them dinner. However, the dishes had not been done. I called my brother in from outside and asked him why, and he laughed at me. After a few minutes of me trying to explain to him how we all needed to help each other out, and I don't ask much, this is where things get hazy, he just laughed at me. I tried to reason with him and he continued to laugh. 
Then he pushed past me and stormed to his room, still laughing. It was like a switch just flipped and I yelled, Don't laugh at me. He laughed harder and I heard his bedroom door slam shut. I stormed up to his room. Every time he laughed at me, I broke something. I smashed everything up and threw the TV at his head, and he just kept laughing at me. At that point, I launched myself at him and wrapped my hands around his neck. Go on, keep laughing, I spat between my clenched teeth. I saw him turn bright red and gasp, clawing at me, but I couldn't stop. It was as though I had no control. At this point, my sister had ran for help. Unfortunately, everyone was at work, so the only help she could find was the neighbor's 12-year-old. By the time they got to us, my brother had turned blue. His eyes rolled into the back of his head and he went limp. My sister screamed at me to get off, you've killed him. I turned to her and start to run towards her. The fear in her eyes as she ran, it was like watching myself yet having no control. I chased after her and she ran through our back garden and towards a small woodland area. I ran after her and on the way I spotted a small wooden axe and picked it up. The neighbor's kid ran to try and find an adult. I saw her jacket or whatever she was wearing hidden behind a tree. I swung the axe as hard as I could. She ducked and I missed. As I tried to pull the axe out from the tree, I saw my terrified baby sister cowered into a ball, sobbing. I heard the neighbor could, running to her aid. He hadn't been able to find an adult, so he had ran back to try and save her. Stunned, I walked home. I slowly walked the staircase to my brother's room. He had come too, and looked me in the eye before raspily saying, I'm sorry. Empty, I walked into my room and broke down. When my sister got home, she ran a bath and walked my zombified self to the bathroom and said, Here, this will help you feel better. When I got out of the bath, my brother had done the dishes. They all stood by me, and although they don't remember much of it now, I'll never forget the day I snapped and almost killed my siblings. I have no idea how we got home. To this day it defies logic. I have asked the people that were with me. They have not even given in a second thought. Bizarre. I wouldn't consider them to be the type of people to ignore crucial details, but then again, Neither am I, and I never even thought to bring it up. Not the next day, not the remainder of our trip, not in the years that followed. Not until one night at a casual dinner that we had together some seven years later. They were just as bewildered as I was. Both of them sat in silence for a moment, bug-eyed and caught deep in thought. How did we get home? I asked them again. I could feel a slight smile tugging lightly at one corner of my mouth as I said it, I knew the answer already. I had pondered it for months. I don't know, they both said in unison. We all sat in silence, unsure of how to continue the conversation. I suppose I should start at the beginning. The listing of the characters and whatnot, what we were doing, why we were there, set the scene, I suppose. The couple I was having dinner with are Ben and Stacy, longtime good friends of mine. They are good people. Ben and I shared a mutual interest in JDM drift cars in my early 20s, and I had met his partner Stacy not long after he and I had met. In 2005, my girlfriend Tegan and I had been invited to go to England to visit my stepfather, and I had offered for Ben and Stacy to join us. They eagerly accepted and saved up the money to come along. I've always held a fascination for old, creepy, and or abandoned properties or houses and was extremely excited to explore England and see what the country had to offer. Stacy shared my interest in such places and had expressed her interest in accompanying me should I find anything. Ben and Tegan were not as keen on the idea but seemed happy to tag along if anything were to eventuate from this. A few days into our trip, I was able to find that there was an old hospital that had been abandoned since the 80s, but it was soon to be repurposed into a mental health clinic. The hospital in question was around a two to three hour drive away into rural English countryside. We rented the car and I spent the best part of an hour explaining to Tegan that if she was going to chicken out on us, it was best that she stayed behind. She insisted that she possessed the testicular fortitude to join us and I, perhaps stupidly, believed her. 
The rental was not cheap, as we were all under the age of 25, which meant that the premium remained in the cost for the rental. Regardless, we split the rental cost between all four of us, and we asked my stepfather's partner to drop us off to collect the car from the rental hub. We picked up the car, an absolute POS manual Fiat 500, as it was the cheapest, yet still expensive option. The rear seats had literally 0% padding for Stacy and Tegan, who had to sit in the back as I was the driver, and Ben towered over all of us. We set up driving and using an outdated roadmap book that my stepfather had lent us. The Navman option had been out of our price range, and let me tell you, I will never again complain about NSW road posting after trying to navigate around the English countryside. The road map was of minimal help as it was so ancient that three of the turnoffs that were clearly displayed on its yellow weathered papers no longer even existed. Twice Ben had informed me of an upcoming T section that never arrived, and yet we seemed to seamlessly enter into the route that we had planned out regardless. We stopped at KFC, which was a massive culture shock to all of us. No potato and gravy, baked beans instead. Thank God our ancestors had committed crimes that had them sent to Australia back in the day. Tegan and Stacy were mumbling about the lack of padding on the back seat, which Ben and I brushed off as unnecessary whining. We finished up lunch and set off on the road again. The days are short in England. The sunlight disappears much quicker than back home. I was not particularly bothered as I just thought that it would simply add to the dark atmosphere when we eventually arrived. We arrived in the general vicinity of the hospital after about two hours of driving and said to heck with the roadmap as it was much more trouble than what it was worth. We saw some old signposts on bent poles that indicated that we were heading in the right direction and decided to follow them. It took us through a rabbit warren of back roads and dirt tracks doing U-turns and a lot of swearing until we came across the ruins of a castle-esque type house that had obviously been gutted out from a fire some years ago. I decided to stop here to stretch our legs and get some photos. The ruins of this place were amazing. I managed to get some great pictures, although I was only starting out as a photographer, and so they are grainy at best. We loitered around for about 45 minutes before deciding to give the hospital one more crack. We piled into the car and white-knuckled the reading of the road map. Ben and I decided on a likely route before I started the car and we set off. We actually managed to find the hospital this time. Ben had chosen the route well and I rolled up to a toll booth that was located on the road just outside the hospital grounds. I could see the building in the distance and the plant equipment section off nearby in order to begin demolition or renovations. The security guard at the toll booth did not seem too pleased to see us and was very dismissive. I imagine he turns people away all the time for the very same reason that we were trying to gain entry. I was determined not to give up though. After I did a three-point turn to get out of the small section of road, I rounded the corner in order to circumnavigate the patrol area and entered an estate at the rear entrance of the hospital. Parking the car, I could see that the hospital lay just beyond an open field nearby. The sky was pitch black by now. The only lighting was coming from dimly lit street lamps that flickered on and off every few seconds. When I opened the door, I noticed that the air was incredibly cold and the street was eerily silent. Stacy and I practically leapt out of the car in anticipation of getting to the hospital, while Ben and Tegan reluctantly opened their respective doors to get out. We all zipped up our jackets and put our scarves on while trudging into the field. The ground was so wet and muddy that we had to use torches on our phones to prevent ourselves from sinking our feet into foot-deep puddles. Clearly this field had been recently used to move the plant equipment to the area, and as a result of much of the terrain was torn up with deep turrets from machine tracks. Stacy and I took the lead while Ben and Tegan lagged behind. I didn't think too much of it. I knew that they were not into this stuff. We walked for about two minutes before I heard Ben call out to us. Stacy and I stopped and turned around. What? I said as I stood still. A light breeze beginning to blow now. Tegan doesn't want to go. Ben said in an apologetic tone. I looked at Tegan. Her head was bowed down towards the ground and her arms were crossed tightly over her chest. We all stood still for a moment and I sighed loudly. Okay, let's go back to the car. Stacy and I were not happy. 
but we knew that leaving Tegan at the car was not an option and we wanted everybody to come with us. Stacy let out an audible curse as we began the painstaking journey back to the little Fiat. When we got back to the car, we all silently got in and took a moment to make our clothing a little more comfortable for travel. And this is where the story gets a little strange. Not much was said between any of us. I started the car and began to drive. We did not discuss a route home and I had no clue where we were. I just started driving. I found a dirt road and took that. Nobody in the car said a word about this. I noticed a sign haphazardly nailed crookedly to a gnarly looking tree that said London 40 miles that somebody had obviously painted and made at home. I continued to drive. I remember nothing about that road. I don't recall anything until I was at a large intersection back in London. I looked around the car. All of us wore stoic expressions and seemed rather listless. Then another skip like a damaged VHS tape. We were at a Chinese restaurant near to where my stepfather lived. We were all sitting around a square table with a cheap blue tablecloth. All of a sudden, all four of our forks slid off the table and onto the floor. Stacy and I were opposite each other when this happened, and we glanced at each other with perplexed expressions before bending down to retrieve our forks together. Stacy looked at me again and said, That was weird. She sounded far off and distant and as though she was talking underwater. What? I asked, straining my ears to hear her just as her volume and cadence returned back to normal. That was weird, she said clear as day. The bustling noises of a busy restaurant are all now returning to fill the void of ambient background noise that I had not even noticed was missing up until that point. Skip again getting into bed and feeling extremely heavy and sedated. We all woke up the next day and seemed perfectly normal. We ate breakfast together while Ben and I cracked bad jokes off each other as we always did. We returned the car later that day after I checked the back seats after the fuss the girls had made and yes, they were indeed devoid of any padding and never spoke of the outing again. Not once. Losing hours of time with friends that can verify that they experienced the exact same thing a subconscious refusal to dwell on it or even bring it up? What actually happened that night? To start off, I'm a 17-year-old from Virginia. About a year and a half ago, I got a job at my local Wendy's. The job kind of sucks, but I keep it to have gas and a little pocket money for the side. I get along well with my employees. I actually made two amazing best friends there. First, let me give you the layout of the kitchen area. There are two ways to come into the kitchen area, one to the left and to the right. If you go to the door on the left, you will walk into the crew room where people place drinks and jackets to be easy to grab when they leave. As you walk through the doorway of the crew room, you will enter the kitchen. To your right, you will see the fry, grill, and front sandwich station that also leads to the front register. If you look to your left, you will see the side sandwich station and drive through As you walk towards the back of the store, you will see the storage room for food and the sink and office in the back. About a year ago, I was working near the fry station alone. Everyone was either in the back office or outside. We didn't have much for orders, so I was just playing on my phone when, all of a sudden, I hear very clearly my first and last name in my right ear. Note that when you are standing in the kitchen, there are a lot of beeps and noises coming from the different machines. Of course, my first instinct was to look around, and I didn't see anyone. The hairs of my arms stood up. I looked around to see if anyone was in the store. I looked in the back to see no one at this point. I was terrified as my heart started beating out of my chest uncontrollably. A few minutes passed by, and all the crew was back in the kitchen. I told my best friend what happened and he chalked it up to the wind or something like that. I still didn't fully know what that was until one of my co-workers confirmed my suspicion. She said that she had the same situation that no one was around, and something said her first and last name in her right ear. A day after we worked the same shift and was talking about the incidents in front of the store, and all of a sudden a stack of cups that was sitting on the counter fell to the ground. We thought it was weird, but once again didn't think much of it. Fast forward to just a couple of days ago, I was working night shift. I was in the back, doing the dishes, listening to Led Zeppelin. 
I was in such a good mood knowing I didn't have to deal with the customers on drive through I stopped doing the dishes for a second just to check my phone in the office. I was facing the opposite way of the door when I felt this sudden eerie feeling to turn around like if someone was watching me. I quickly turned to find no one there. I go to the storage space to see if someone walked by, but nope. Everyone was up front in the kitchen area, so I go back to the office, this time facing the sink and the walkway leading to the storage room and kitchen. While I was on my phone, I felt this presence to the right of my shoulder like someone's head was over my shoulder. It felt like someone was actually there, looking forward. I slowly turned to see nothing. This incident has really shaken me up to when I was driving home that night, I felt as if though someone was in my back seat watching me. I stopped in the road, flipped on my light to see nothing. I have no idea if I should be scared if this thing is still with me or just carry on. Either way, I really think something or someone is lurking near the restaurant that being a demon or just a lost spirit. Tell me what you guys think. Thank you. The first story takes place in my dad's hometown in the Mexican state of Chihuahua in the year 2000. Living in Mexico was very different from living in the US to say the least. Our family would move from home to home due to my parents being from different towns and the respective in-laws not liking each other. My father's aunt allowed my family to move into the vacant home attached to hers for as long as he wanted. This small home was very typical for a rural Mexican home and it was made of mud brick with an iron door and two windows next to the door. The inside of the home was composed of one large family room that was a mix between a living room and a bedroom, a bathroom, and a kitchen that led out to the garden. Due to the small size of the home, my parents and I would sleep in the family room. My parents had their queen-size bed by the front door and my bunk bed by the rightmost wall of the home. The night that I had my encounter was a night like any other. My parents and I ate dinner and watched TV in bed until we fell asleep. I remember being awoken by a feeling of panic and fear. I felt paralyzed and I could only move my head. Something told me not to look at the wall to my right, yet I felt compelled to. I could not fight the urge to not look for long. Turning to look at the wall, I saw a woman's face coming through the wall. The face was grotesque, to say the least. She had long, messy black hair, pale skin white eyes and her mouth was full of what I could only describe as shark teeth. I wanted to scream as she opened her mouth and got closer to my face. After what seemed like an eternity, the face vanished and I could move again. I immediately ran over to my sleeping parents, crying and trembling as I woke them up. My mom woke up and asked me what was wrong in a sleepy tone. I told her what I saw and she simply dismissed it as a nightmare and let me sleep between her and my dad. My mom told me years later that I refused to sleep in that bunk bed until my dad removed the top bunk and stored it in another home. Until this day, my mom believes that I simply had a nightmare or sleep paralysis, which I always deny, especially after she revealed that a woman died in that house. This next story takes place in the US. I was 19 at the time, and I was working at a family dollar store up the street from my house. There was nothing weird or off about this house, aside from it being a low-income part of the city. Seven months into my tenure at the store, the other employees began telling me about weird things that happened at the store. They even had a name for the ghost, Jeff. I was very skeptical about the claims my coworkers made. I just thought they wanted to scare the new guy until one day I experienced Jeff's presence firsthand. It was a Saturday. I was working 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. I got the urge to go to the restroom. I headed over to the stock room where we had the employee restrooms as the regular restrooms were disgusting and often not working. I opened the stall and got to do business. It was no more than five minutes when I heard someone exhale and what sounded like boxes falling outside of the bathroom. I finished my business as soon as possible. I checked the stock room and nothing was out of place. Out of panic, I immediately ran back to the register and continued my shift as normal. The last 30 minutes of my shift came and... I needed to take a leak and thus had no choice but to go use the restroom in the stockroom again. The room had a very unfriendly atmosphere to it and I got a headache as soon as I stepped foot in there. I took the fastest leak I ever had taken and ran out. The headache faded after five minutes of leaving that room. 
I went home and began feeling a cold coming on that night. The next morning I woke up with appendicitis. I have no idea if this was brought on by whatever was back there, but I still refuse to even look at the room when I go shop there. The last story happened two years ago. I was home alone drying myself after a shower. When the bathroom doorknob made turning sounds, I turned to see the doorknob turning. I knew no one was home, so I ran out to see if someone had broken in. I checked every room and made sure that all the windows were closed and the front door was locked. There was no sign of a break-in. I was the only one in the house. I'm currently in my late teens, and since I was a child, I've had obscure, incredibly vivid dreams, most of them being lucid. However, I've had some dreams, or visions, I suppose. They have unnerved me for as long as I can remember, and since I was about four years old, I have correctly predicted every family death to happen yet. The first of these strange occurrences happened when I was four years old. As a child, my family had a close friend who I considered a second father to me. We'll call him Anthony out of respect. Anthony visited our house every weekend since I was about two years old. Together we would go swimming at family barbecues or whenever he had time off of work. He was a great man. At the age of four, though I didn't understand at the time, Anthony passed away after a long battle with skin cancer. My family was devastated and I miss him to this day. In the following months, I recall having a dream in which Anthony and I were sat around our swimming pool in the backyard. Our feet dipped in the deep end, which was filled with dozens of beautiful tropical fish and bright coral. I've had this dream multiple times over the years, and the main detail that has always stood out to me is the intense, overpowering smell that accompanies every dream. For years, I could never put a name to the scent, but I know now that it was coconut. At the age of nine or so, I began to notice the same overpowering scent of coconut, only this time it was while I was wide awake. It didn't matter where I was or what time of the day it was. To this day, I may be sat in my room and the scent appears. At work, and I sense it again, or even out with friends, and it's all I seem to be breathing in. No one else has ever smelled the same scent, though. Not in the ten or so years I've had these experiences. Fast forward to age 14, and we're doing renovations in the backyard, which required moving a bit of outdoor furniture around. When it comes to moving the barbecue, my mom stops and pulls out a bottle from the corner of the grill that had been sat in there for at least ten years. She holds it up to me, asking if I remember Anthony's iconic tanning lotion. In that moment, I remember my child family friend's favorite lotion. He wore it religiously. Now, can you guess what scent the lotion was? Coconut. Now for the premonitions, the first of many unnerving dreams to come occurred in 2015 in which I was with my family, my parents and grandparents. All these years later I no longer remember the exact details but what I do remember is that my grandfather got sick, very sick. I awoke with a churning sensation in my stomach but for the most part I tried to brush it aside, blaming anxiety or paranoia for the vivid dreams. Fast forward to 2018. I find out my grandfather had just been diagnosed with cancer. We were devastated, but for the most part my parents tried to remain optimistic. We were hopeful he would get through it. 2020, I awake from a horrid dream. I had dreamt I had just gone to my grandfather's funeral. In the following months it became clear that he would not be recovering and it was one of the hardest things my family and I have gone through. June 2020, I experience another dream, only this time I, myself, am not present in the room, but rather hovering over the scene observing what plays out. For the sake of keeping this free from possible trigger warnings, my grandfather is in a hospital bed surrounded by my grandmother and mother. Things don't look good, and strangely in that moment I distinctly remember the number 38 coming to mind. Two days later, I told my grandfather has gone to hospital in palliative care and he won't be returning home. Heartbroken, my mother and I go to visit him. We are directed to room 38. I walked into the exact room, same bed, same room, arrangements, same windows. He passed away two days later, and I am at least grateful to say that I got to say goodbye because I knew I had to go and what would happen if I hadn't. 
These premonitions don't just extend to human family members, but pets as well. Back in April of 2020, I had a dream in which I said goodbye to one of our beloved cats and watched her walk into the distance. I awoke with the strongest sense of dread, but for the most part, brushed it off once more with the excuse of paranoia. On May 10th, we rushed our sweet girl to the emergency vet, where we were informed she was suffering unexpected heart failure. We had to say goodbye to her that very day, and she was only 11. At this point, I had mentioned my dreams to my mother, who, despite not believing in the paranormal or whatnot, found the dreams grimly fascinating. I was relieved she didn't brush me off like every other ghost film to exist. October 2020, one day ago as of when I'm writing this, I had another premonition. I was there with our other cat, who had just turned 12. He was my cat. He was my fur baby. His sister, our cat, who we had just lost months before, sits calmly before us. I watch as my cat joins his sister, and together they walk off into the distance. I wake up in the morning to hear my mother frantic in the dining room. I step out of my room to discover my boy isn't well. He isn't well at all. A mere 50 minutes later, we are told he, like his sister, is suffering unexpected heart failure due to a genetic heart defect. We say goodbye to him. He passed away yesterday, two hours after I had a dream in which he joined his sister. They're together now, and I hope they keep each other good company. I'm upset just putting this into words. However, I don't feel it's over yet. Approximately two weeks ago, I had another dream in which my biological father got sick. Very sick. The dream showed my family members exact lifespans and the time each of us have left. Now I'm conflicted. Do I tell my mother to warn her in case it too happens? What if I'm wrong this time and cause her unnecessary worry just months after the passing of her father? I really don't know what to do. Take this as you will. Maybe this is just a long list of coincidences or keen senses. All I know is that sometimes I'm afraid of what I might dream next. You know that old joke that if you pick a college major you enjoy, you'll never have to work a day in your life because that field isn't hiring? Well, that joke became a reality when I graduated college and was faced with a pretty much non-existent job market. The only thing I had going for me was a significant amount of money that my grandma had left me when I was 16. I had put that money away and planned on using it for a down payment on a house one day, but I realized that the house wasn't going to be any good to me without a job to pay the mortgage, bills, and other expenses. I pulled out about half of that money and purchased an old John Deere 310C backhoe loader and decided to start an excavating company. Being in a fairly rural town, I made most of my money starting out doing tile drain work for farmers. For those of you who aren't from a farming background, tile is actually this plastic hose that's perforated with millions of tiny holes and then surrounded with filter cloth. It's buried in trenches and fields to drain excess water away. Most of the trenches are dug with a big machine called a tile plow that would look right at home as a Decepticon in the Transformers movie, but the corners and T-joints where the two tile drains would meet would need to be dug with a backhoe. Also, they needed another machine to fill the trenches in anyway, so that's where I came in. It was a good practice since you can't really mess up digging a trench for a tile drain, and after a while I got pretty good with the machine. Well, things just kind of snowballed from there. One farmer I was working for said that he had a brother closer to town who wanted an in-ground swimming pool and asked if I was interested in doing that. I accepted the job and once that was done, he referred another customer to me. Eventually winter came and I bought a box plow attachment for the front bucket and secured a contract with the town to clear snow in the parking lot of the town hall, arena, library, and a few parks. I pretty much broke even on my investment the first season I was in business and after the second season, I was starting to see profits. Being a waterfront town, the construction industry in my area was booming, with cottages being put up all along the shoreline, so there was no shortage of work. The only shortcoming of my business plan was that I didn't have a commercial license to drive a semi, so the only way I could get my big machine from job to job was to just drive it down the road. 
This wasn't a big deal since the majority of my work was in town or the immediate surrounding area, and a friend of mine whose family owned a storage complex was letting me keep the backhoe in their yard free of charge, but still the travel times did limit how much I could get done in one day. It got to the point where I decided I needed a second machine and to hire another operator. Fast forward five years into this, and I have my own yard with three machines going. The original John Deere 310C, which is now being run by Kayla, who's probably better at running it than me, and thusly the only one I trust with that machine. It's kind of my baby, since it's what's built the company. I have a smaller John Deere 110 backhoe for doing smaller residential landscaping work where the 310 is too big. It's also got a cool feature where you can take the backhoe arm off and use it like a normal farm tractor, so I can hook up other attachments to it and do all sorts of jobs. Finally, I have a Bobcat S100 skid steer loader, mostly for cleanup work or spreading gravel and stuff in tight areas. As it is with owning your own business, I'm stuck in the office most days and not able to get out on the work sites as much as I'd like, but I'd come to learn one day, maybe that isn't such a bad thing. One afternoon in late October, I was sitting in my office when the phone rings. It's Kayla telling me there's an issue with the job she's currently on, and that I need to come out there immediately, although she seems reluctant to tell me what exactly the problem is. I remember it was another case of a customer being a bit of a jerk and not taking her seriously since she's a female, about my age. People don't even take me seriously due to my age sometimes, and she is very attractive, like... She really doesn't look like the type of person who would be doing this type of work, so she gets a lot of guff from people about it. Her and I have dealt with this pretty much ever since I hired her, and it doesn't faze her. It's more of an inconvenience than anything, so I knew how to handle it. I get out to the farm where she's digging a trench to bury some water lines for the guy's cattle, and when I get out of the truck, I see her having a perfectly friendly conversation with the farmer. Great, I think to myself. If she's not being harassed, then we must be dealing with some kind of equipment failure for her to make me come out here. I ask her what's up, and she walks me back to where she had been digging with the 310 and tells me to look in the dirt pile. I turn and look, and I'm about to ask her what I'm looking for when I notice. Looking back at me is a human skull. I almost fell over backwards when I saw it. You, you dug that up here? I ask her. Yes, she replies. I haven't told the farmer yet, and he hasn't seen it. I just told him I had a hydraulic leak, and that's what you were coming to fix. I don't know what to do. Should we call the cops? I was hesitant to call the cops, because if it was just a skull, it's not like it was fresh and part of some open investigation. We should probably tell the guy, I said. Farmers bury relatives in the back pasture all the time. It's probably just as great-grandfather and he forgot where he was. Kayla seemed to agree with me, so we told the guy. He chuckled and pretty much confirmed my theory. He didn't know who it was, but he did say that he knew some of his ancestors were buried on the property in various locations. We had him put the skull back in the trench, and we rerouted the water lines so that we wouldn't have to disturb his ancestors' final resting place. From that day forward, the John Deere 310C developed a whole host of mechanical problems. One day it was a hydraulic leak, the next it would be an electrical issue. One morning I came into the shop and all four tires were completely flat despite them having no damage and the bead being perfectly seated on the rim. This was a big problem since the 310 was my main snow removal machine for the winter months and snow season was fast approaching. Luckily most of the digging work I had lined up was smaller jobs the 110 could handle so I spent most of November in the shop trying to fix the 310. The problem was that any of the issues I found seemed to magically resolve themselves whenever I tried to find the cause, making it basically impossible to figure out. This was incredibly frustrating since it meant that it would just break down randomly and there was nothing I could do about it. The snow finally flew in December and even though the 310 was still temperamental at best, I had no choice but to send it out. Kayla had given it the nickname Christine after the car from the Stephen King book since she always joked about it being possessed by the farmer's great-grandfather after our accidental archaeology incident. My take on the situation was that Christine was just getting old and needed more attention, and I was already in the market for a new main backhoe. The most notable incident from that winter was when Kayla was out plowing a gas station parking lot at 5am and the engine ran away on her. For those of you who don't 
No, a diesel engine doesn't have spark plugs, so the only way to shut it down is to shut off the fuel supply. If something goes wrong and fuel gets in where it's not supposed to, you essentially lose control of the engine. Luckily, Kayla was able to shut the machine down by shoveling snow into the air intake and avoid a massive disaster. After that happened, I decided to finally pull the trigger on the new machine I had been eyeing up, a John Deere 310SK. I just didn't trust Christine's engine anymore after that night. I put her out behind the shop while I decided what to do with her. It seemed a shame to get rid of her since she had started my whole business and been what got me out of my depressing situation. She had taken me from a broke college graduate in debt with student loans and no job to owning my own business and a house in only five years, and she felt like a member of the family at that point. Even more so now that Kayla had stenciled the name Christine onto the loader and arm with a can of spray paint making the name official. Well, the decision as to whether or not to get rid of Christine was one I wouldn't have to make. The night before the new backhoe was to be dropped off in my yard, I was working late in the office. It was around 9pm and I was just getting ready to shut down my computer when I smelled smoke. And not like wood-burning smoke, like rubber-burning smoke. I ran outside and through the thick black smoke saw Christine completely engulfed in flames. It took firefighters until 2am to get the fire under control and another hour to completely extinguish because every time they put it out, it just sparked right back up again. The next day, I arranged for a local junkyard to come and take the remains away. What was weird about the fire was it was hot enough to melt some of the steel components, yet somehow left the wooden fence that the machine was parked up against completely unscathed, like there wasn't even a burn mark on it. In fact, once the burnt-out wreck was hauled away, there was hardly any evidence that there had even been a fire at all. The official verdict was that an electrical fault caused the fire, but I'm not entirely convinced. It's got me thinking that maybe Kayla's theory about the old farmer's ancestor we disturbed has more truth to it than I initially thought. An awful thought had crossed my mind that maybe the skull really was some unsolved murder case and the victim was taking out their frustrations on me for not getting their case solved. I don't know, maybe I should have called the cops, but it's in the past now. Either way, whoever it is, their reign of terror over my business seemed to stop with the destruction of Christine. Outside of normal wear and tear, I've had no issues with any of my machinery since, and the business is better than ever. For Christmas one year, Kayla's boyfriend, who's a graphic designer, made me one of those call-before-you-dig signs, but where the phone number normally is, there's a picture of a widget board. It's hanging up in my shop beside our health and safety board as a humorous reminder that you never really know who's down there until you dig it up. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. If you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, if you're not thick, we ain't gonna click. <laughs> Thanks so much, friends. And remember, baby gravy loves croissants. <laughs>